Ahlan wa sahlan, khosh amadid, bienvenue, and a very warm welcome to you all to Al-Mahdi Al Institute's Hoza graduation, celebrating the achievements of our graduates of the Hoza program, honorary awardees, AMI's 25th year jubilee anniversary, and of course, England striding into the semifinals, inshallah. It's a great honor for us to be joined in this celebration <clears throat> by family, friends, and patrons of the Institute, and I welcome you all cordially. My name is Nazmin Adanji, and I currently head the Department of Arabic Studies here at AMI, and I will be your MC for this afternoon. Having been involved in curriculum development, teaching, and translation at the Institute for the past seven years, I have personally witnessed the growth of the Institute through its recent activities and initiatives. And I feel very proud to celebrate this joyous occasion with you all this afternoon. To my right, we have our graduates of the Hosa program and honorary awardees whose achievements we'll be acclaiming this afternoon. And to my right, we have our AMI faculty team who have been a part of the graduates' journeys on the Hosa program. <clears throat> the program for this afternoon will initiate with the recitation of the Holy Quran followed by a special presentation explaining AMI's journey over the past 25 years, the launch of the International Center for Collective Ijtihad, and an address by the director of AMI. This will swiftly lead us on to the presentation of our graduate awards, to recognize the achievements of our graduates, followed by the presentation of the two honorary awards. The first is the Ayatollah Amini Award for Academic Excellence, and the second is the AMI Humanitarian Award, honoring the outstanding contributions of the recipients. With the aim to inspire and encourage others, especially our graduates, to serve and contribute to the causes of humanity and learning. Finally, we will conclude with an address on behalf of the Board of Trustees, after which there will be a drinks reception in the AMI gardens, beautiful sunny gardens today, um, with outdoor photography, followed by a celebratory dinner to be held in the dining room at 6.15, 6.30, inshallah. So without further ado, I'd like to call Brother Muhammad Ali, who's regularly delighted us with his eloquent recitation of the Holy Quran, to come and grace the occasion with a few verses from the Holy Quran. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa idh qala al-hawariyun ya
May Allah reward you, Brother Muhammad Ali, for that captivating recitation. In celebration of AMI's Silver Jubilee anniversary, I'd now like to call upon our very own Sheikh Muhammad Reza Tajri to give a short presentation walking us through AMI's journey over the past 25 years. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Grand scholars, graduates, colleagues, guests, sisters, brothers, to all of you, assalamu alaikum. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for joining us today to celebrate the great achievements of our graduates here. In addition to the honorary awardees from whom we'll be hearing a bit more later on, but as we've heard, this Jewish occasion also coincides with the Silver Jubilee, the 25-year anniversary from the founding of this institute, the Al-Mahdi Institute, which we now affectionately abbreviate to AMI. As a lecturer here at the institute, I'm often asked, what do you do at AMI? What is AMI about? So my primary purpose here this afternoon is not just to update you on the England score, which is good news, by the way, for the time being. But it is with a short presentation to take you through our journey over the past 25 years, ending with the initiatives and operations that take place here today. It all started in 1993 in a small two-bedroom apartment above Stratford Road. Here, the foundation and the vision of the Al-Mahdi Institute was established. To what end? to establish an educational institute in Europe that could provide students with advanced training in Islamic studies and the Arabic language tailored specifically for those living in a multicultural and plural society. Since that time, AMI has come leaps and bounds 
and is now operating over three main sectors, education, research, and outreach. At the heart of AMI education, firstly, lies the Hausa program. Based on the curricula taught at the traditional seminaries of Qum and Najaf, AMI's Hausa program encourages students to use critical approaches to gain a deeper understanding of classical as well as contemporary texts. The program is delivered entirely in English and in Arabic by faculty members from a diverse traditional as well as academic backgrounds, giving our students a well-grounded and well-rounded appreciation of all the material taught. As an added bonus now, from September of 2018, students who successfully complete the first three years of our Hausa program will now have the opportunity to obtain a postgraduate master's degree in Islamic studies awarded by the University of Birmingham in the final year. This means that AMI will be somewhat unique in offering its students a chance to obtain a postgraduate qualification on completion of a Hausa program, which will open doors to a wide range of career paths, not limited only to academia or community leadership. AMI research, on the other hand, focuses on providing a platform for the exchange of ideas and cutting-edge research contributing to Muslim thought. For the past six years, AMI has been successful in hosting an annual contemporary Fiqhi Issues workshop, bringing together leading scholars and academics from around the globe to discuss and provide solutions for contemporary issues affecting Muslims in the modern world. Among the variety of topics discussed, the past, present and future of Shi'i Ijtihad, the status of non-Muslims in the Sharia, violence in Sharia, and many more. And the huge success of these flagship annual Fiqhi workshops has led to the creation of the International Center for Collaborative Ijtihad, or ICCI, which brings together mujtahids and experts in specialist fields to collectively issue statements and offer guidance and advice to Muslims living in a modern society. Now, these statements will include full justification for their conclusions on contemporary issues affecting Muslims worldwide, among which are women's right to divorce in Islam, consumption of food prepared by non-Muslims, the correct age of bulugh, determining the time of Maghrib, etc. And you can find out more about this in the next talk uh, delivered by Ayatollah Professor Muhaqiq Damad, who will discuss the purpose and the need for ICCI. Furthermore, we have relaunched AMI Press, which now consists of an international editorial board comprising of 15 transnationally based renowned academics. Since 2016, AMI Press has commissioned several scholarly projects, including the Arabic-English edition of Tafsir al-Ayashi and a multi-volume series on the translations of the works of Al-Allam al-Hilli. Finally, through AMI Outreach, we have been providing an open, safe, and scholarly platform that addresses the needs of interface, intraface, and from the grassroots communities some of the main centers established uh, within AMI Outreach are the following. The Center of, for, Internet, for Intra-Muslim Studies, or SIMS, as we have abbreviated it to, which was established in 2015 with the aim of uniting Sunni and Shia Muslims worldwide by addressing and resolving those issues which often cause sectarian strife. SIMS brings together scholars from various Muslim schools of thought to discuss issues such as succession of the Holy Prophet, the concept of imamology and infallibility, the status of the Sahaba, and many more issues. Following each of these discussions, a joint statement is published to provide clarity on these discussed issues. And following the great success of Sims, we are in the process now of launching the Center for Decree and Doctrines, also known as Darul Ifta'i Wal Aqa'id which allows Muslim scholars from both Sunni and Shia backgrounds to come together and collectively reflect upon jurisprudential as well as theological issues of concern 
and provide unified solutions and guidelines that can be followed by Muslims living in the West. The Center for Doctrine, the for Decree and Doctrine will be launching in early 2019 once at least 60 issues have been discussed and addressed. Apart from our intra-faith work, we recently established the Shia Scholars Forum in the winter of 2017, which aims to unite a diverse range of Shi'i scholars to discuss and debate the issues and challenges faced within the Shia community, although they be worldwide, and how they might be resolved. The Shia Scholars Forum is also a platform for collective learning, which allows scholars to share their unique perspectives, ideas, and research with one another and with other scholars in a very safe and open environment. Furthermore, we also have the Inter-Religious Symposia, launched earlier this year, which brings together scholars and theologians from diverse religious backgrounds, allowing them to explore and learn more about different faith traditions. The Inter-Religious Symposia will discuss how topical issues such as life after death, predestination and free will, animal rights, the environment, etc., are perceived by different faiths. Last, but by no means least, the Al Mahdi Institute Library, AMI Library, hosts one of the largest collections of Shi'i literature in Europe, holding over 20,000 specialist works. I've read nearly all of them. In Arabic, English, Persian, and Urdu languages. Currently, the AMI Library is continuing to expand its collection and now has a separate collection for English literature in the new English Library, which is located upstairs. I hope that this presentation has been useful in providing an insight into the activities that we've been initiating and steadily uh, continuing, which is starting here, but branching out across the world. Now, this presentation and all the activities might sound like a lot to take in and too much is going on. But it is with the hard work of the staff at the Al Mahdi Institute that allows us to churn out quality graduates, collaborating with other institutions, cooperating with other faith traditions, which allows us to focus on each of these initiatives and deliver these noble goals. We are, of course, indebted to our supporters and funders for encouraging and inspiring the work we do here. And for more information about all of this, you can find out uh, a lot more from your graduation booklet or by visiting our website. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. And I hope you thoroughly enjoy the rest of your evening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Sheikh Dajri, for that very insightful and comprehensive presentation. It's clear that AMI has come a long way from where it started and that there are many more exciting prospects on the horizon. One of which, as you heard in the presentation, is the International Center for Collective Ijtihad, also known henceforth as ICCI. We would now, now like to show you a short video to further explain what ICCI is about and how it will operate. The International Center for Collective Ijtihad, also known as the ICCI, offers guidance and advice to Muslims living in today's society by providing responses to wide-ranging issues that are of practical concern. These include questions like, do women have a right to divorce in Islam? How should the beginning of New Islamic Month be determined? Can Muslims consume food prepared by non-Muslims? And more. The ICCI provides responses by bringing together two groups of scholars. The first group consists of religious scholars, or mojtahids, who specialize in Islamic sciences and understand the nuances required to deduce Sharia law. And the second group consists of experts, who specialize in different fields of knowledge such as medicine, astronomy, social sciences, business, commerce and more. Through seeking advice from the experts, the religious scholars issue statements of guidance. The idea is that the collective knowledge and skill sets of both groups of scholars ensures that the most effective rulings are obtained. In addition, the ICCI supplements every issued statement with justifications, allowing readers to clearly understand the rationale behind each statement. 
This allows the reader to make an informed decision of whether to follow and act in accordance with the ICCI's guidance and advice. Now we're very fortunate that Ayatollah Professor Sayyid Muhaqiq Damad, the chair of ICCI, has joined us all the way from Tehran. And I would thus like to take this opportunity to ask him to explain to us all the need for having an international center for collective ijtihad in today's world. Ayatollah Muhaqiq Damad is currently a senior professor of jurisprudence and law at Shaheed Bahishti University in Tehran. Aside from his extensive traditional Hoza education, spanning over 20 years, the respected Ayatollah also received his doctorate in international law from the University of Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium. In addition, he's published over 20 volumes of literature in Islamic law and ethics. His grandfather, Grand Ayatollah Abdul Karim Ha'iri Yazdi, was the founder of the famous Hoza Seminary in Qum. Please can I request Ayatollah Professor Sayyid Muhaqiq Damad to come to the podium. The respected scholar will address us in Arabic, which we will then proceed to translate into English. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, I present a text in Arabic, and so the lady will translate for you the, in English. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. إن خاتمية نبوة نبينا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم والشريعة الإسلامية القراء لا تتم إلا مع ضم نظرية الاجتهاد المستمر لأن من المسلم أن الحوادث الواقعة والوظائف الشرعية التي تظهر في كل يوم لأبناء البشر من المكلفين لا تعد ولا تحصى ومن لوازم الدين الكامل أن يبين ويعين ما هو وظيفة أبناء ملته حتى يعملوا ويصلوا إلى السعادة الأبدية ألا هذا إن إذا قلنا أن الاجتهاد يكون مكمل خاتمية الشريعة القراء ليس قولا جزافيا بل هو قول صحيح جدا إن من مختصات الشيعة الإمامية الإثنى عشرية الابتهاج بانفتاح باب الاجتهاد ولذا إذا نظرنا إلى الفقه الإسلامي عبر التاريخ نرى التحضل والتطور العظيم للفقه الجعفري منذ البداية إلى الحين إن الغذايا والحوادث الواقعة التي تكون تجاهنا في آلمنا المعاصر قد تتكاثر وتتزايد في كل يوم بل في كل ساعة ولحظة لعظامل الشطة أولا السرعة التي نرى السرعة التي نرى للعلوم والتكنولوجيا والفنون وتأثيره في حياة المجتمع البشري هذا أولا وثانيا تتظر عيش أبناء المجتمع والثقافة والهرارة هذا ثانيا وثالثا 
مهاجرة المسلمين من مواطنهم الأولية وتفرقهم واتخاذهم الموطن في أقصى البلاد ومواجهتهم مع هضارات العديدة المؤاصرة نحن نفتكر أن الاجتهاد اللازم نحن نفتكر أن الاجتهاد اللازم لأجوبة الأسئلة في هذه الشرائط لا يمكن أن يكون كاملا إلا إذا كان جميعا مع تضارب الآراء وتآمل الأفكار من جوانب مختلف من جوانب مختلفة لأن الفقيه لا يمكن له صدور رأي ثاقب إلا إذا فهم الموضوع أولا إن الفقيه إذا يرى صدور الرأي لهرمة الربا لأعمال البنوك كيف يمكن له إستار الرأي مع عدم الدقة وعدم التفهم وعدم التفهم لمعنى المعاملات, المعاملات البنكية بالأخص ما معنى للنقود المعاصرة ما معنى ما معنى للنقود المعاصرة في, في عالمنا المعاصر لأن الفقيه لا يمكن له صدور رأي ساقب إذا فهل إلا إذا فهم الموضوع ولا يمكن له فهمه إلا بالتشاور مع الأخصائيين مثلا هول المسائل التبية أيمكن صدور الفتوى بلا المشاورة مع, أت... مع, أت... مع الأطباء والأخصائيين في التب والمهندسين والمنجمين وعلماء المجتمع لا يمكن إن أهل العلم والثقافة في عالمنا المعاصر لا يرضون بمحز الفتوى هذا أخيرا هذا نكتة مهمة أريد أن أضف إلى المطالب العالية إن أهل العلم والثقافة في عالمنا المعاصر بينهم فرق عظيم مع مع الجمعية والملة السابقين لهم فرق عظيم إن أهل العلم والثقافة في عالمنا المعاصر لا يرضون بمحز الفتوى في جواب أسئلتهم إنهم يطلبون منا النظر مع الاستدلال والتوضيحات المقنعة إن الشباب يجيئون إلينا ويسألون بعض المسائل إنهم لا يقنعون بال بمحض الفتوى الأقوى هذا الأحبد هذا هذا حرام هذا حلال فقط إنهم يطلبون منا الاستدلال والإقناع وأخيرا نحن في هذا المنطلق أيها الإخوة والأخوات سيداتي وساداتي نحن في هذا المنطلق نريد أن نتفحص وندرس المسائل مع إمكان النظر في كل مسألة من مسائل التي تطلبها مقتضيات الزمان ونعرضها إلى اللجنة كي تتباهثوا وتتناظروا هولها ولما وصلنا إلى نقطة مشتركة نجعلها في مواقعنا الإلكترونية لملاحظة الأموم ونتقبل ونستقبل بفائق المن والشكر والاحترام كل نقد وانتقاد والملاحظة والتعليق فإذا فإنا نعتقد ونفتخر بحديث منتسب إلى مولانا الباقر عليه السلام 
ve aleyhi salavatullahi tebareke ve teala inne hayatel ilm bil bahsi ve nakdi ve selamu aleykum ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu Thank you very much, Sayyidina, for your thought-provoking words. The respected Ayatollah, after greeting us all, made several points regarding the need for collective ijtihad, and I will mention them in point form. Firstly, he said that the finality of our Prophet and the Islamic Sharia cannot be complete except through the acceptance of a continuous process of ijtihad. This is because newer occurrences and challenges faced by the faithful have no end on the one hand, and on the other hand, a complete religion sees itself obliged to respond to such challenges. Accordingly, ijtihad is a completer of the Islamic Sharia. Secondly, amongst the distinctions of the Imami 12 Shia is that they have left the door of ijtihad open, and consequently, we have witnessed tremendous progress and development historically within Ja'far fiqh. Thirdly, the newer challenges facing us within the contemporary era are constantly increasing due to several factors, such as the speed of technological advances, together with development in other areas of modern research and their impact on human life and community, modern lifestyle and the merging of civilizations within the global village, the migration of Muslims to different parts of the world and as a result, encountering different cultures, lifestyles, and social setups. Fourthly, we are of the opinion that the ijtihad that is needed to respond to such challenges and questions arising from them cannot be complete unless it's a collective endeavor with cooperation and collaboration of a variety of opinions from differing perspectives. This is because the jurist cannot provide an accurate view except through a proper understanding of the subject matter. And a proper understanding and appreciation of the subject matter necessarily requires consultation with experts in various fields, such as medicine, social sciences, astronomy, etc. And lastly, people within the contemporary world are no longer satisfied with mere fatwas and decrees of what is permissible and what is prohibited. They require rationale and explanations leading to the fatawa. In conclusion, therefore, we will as a group consider questions facing us within the modern world and collectively discuss them and consult with others. When we reach a consensus, we will present our findings to the public for them to uphold. At the same time, we welcome and appreciate every form of critique, observation, and commentary in relation to what we present. We're committed to the report of our blessed Imam al-Baqir who said, indeed the life of knowledge is sustained through discussion and critique. Peace and blessings be with you all. Your brother Sayyid Mustafa Muhaqqiq Damad. Thank you once again, um, Sayyidna, for your very informative and thought-provoking rationale. Next up, we have the director's speech by the one and only Sheikh Arif Abdul Hussein, who is also the founder of the Institute. It has been through his tireless endeavors and leadership that the Institute has grown from its humble beginnings to what you see today. Sheikh Arif, through his visionary approach, has facilitated the creation of an open and safe environment at AMI, which has allowed scholars and students from around the world to openly express and review their beliefs and opinions for the ultimate purpose of intellectual and spiritual growth. On behalf of all AMI students, faculty, staff, funders and patrons, I would like to thank Sheikh Arif for his continuous dedication and hard work towards AMI and the betterment of the global human family. Please can I invite Sheikh Arif Abdul Hussein to come and enlighten us with a few words. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin wa ashabihi al-muntajibin. Amma ba'd, assalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Peace be with us all. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I stand here very humbled before Allah and as a servant of the community and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving this wonderful opportunity of life to be, even if it is half heartedly, committed to what might yield His pleasure and to you all for allowing this humble servant to serve the community in whatever capacity one has been able to serve. When we established the Al Mahdi Institute, we could not have anticipated how far the Institute would go. And I want us just to recount those 25 years very briefly. After graduating from Madrasa Said Al Khui and going for postgraduate Islamic studies in Iran, and the person instrumental behind that was none other than Mulana Sayyid Hussein Murtaba. Purchased a house there and was studying. When I came back, Marhum Mullah Azgar Saab and Sheikh Dafar Abbas, my illustrious teachers, they asked me to head the Madrasa Sayyid Al Khui. I asked them to allow me to come to Birmingham instead and to set something up in Birmingham. They gave their blessings. The person who was extremely instrumental in the creation of the Al-Mahdi Institute was the late Ayatollah Hussein Al-Amini, and I'm so honored to be one of his many students. I asked him, I said, I have an important matter that needs a decision because I've declined a mighty offer. So he said, then, tell me what it is. I said, no. Can you do an istikhara for me? Since then, of course, the reliance on istikhara has lessened. He said, the istikhara is phenomenal. Whatever you're intending is good. Go and do it. I said, I'm penniless. I want to establish a hosa in Birmingham. He said, whatever I can do for you, I will. Go and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do the rest. So I came to Birmingham and I was standing in the mosque and just reflecting on what needs to be done. And a man came and he said, I have a huge sum of money and I will only give it to you. Sounds like a fairy tale, doesn't it? It actually happened. And I leave it at your discretion to do whatever you want with that money. So I said, this can't be happening. Then we said, well, what about a place? And a very dear sister of ours, Nilambai, she said, I have a flat. Why don't you use that flat? So 25 years ago, with Sheikh Mubashir, Ahmad, Jahrumi, my brother-in-law, we began the Al Mahdi Institute on Stratford Road. And we bought furniture with the money given by that individual in the morning. And we had a handful of students from there to here. It's been a blessing and a grace of God. But this journey has brought key and vital people to the Al Mahdi Institute. And it has brought so many challenges. But every challenge was to the benefit of the Institute. It grew through those challenges. Those were, in fact, now looking back at them, opportunities of revising the identity of the Institute, of arriving at a greater pedestal of existence. We began the Institute very naively. I suppose now I would say very, with very arrogant assumptions that we have the truth and we need to impart this truth to this point now where we say we need to understand the truth, share and learn from the others. From a God that was exclusive for the Muslims to a colorless God. From a Muslim God to a God who is beyond religion. From wanting salvation for the community to wanting to create a godly family with all its colors, variety, plurality. From a point of arrogance and seeing that we have the truth 
to a point of utmost humility. The truth is contained within the chests of the creatures of God. That every one of them are the lights of Allah. And beyond the revelative truth is the truth of the handiwork of God in what he has created. In the process, the challenges that we faced, we grew. And I want to talk about key individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought to the establishment that led to its flourishing and growth. And each one of them was handpicked. Of course, there are many that I have mentioned in my past and previous talks. So I will restrict it to a few. First and foremost, when there was utmost difficulties, I went to the pilgrimage in that year. I don't want to say too much about my personal life here, but I went to the Kaaba of Allah. I placed, placed my chest upon the wall of the Kaaba. It's a very difficult thing to do. You almost get crushed. And I said, Allah, the institute is yours. Why should I be struggling? Aren't you the one who saved this house from Abraha and his elephants? This is just a small flat. Why can't you look after it? I said, in any case, oh God, I go back from here empty-handed and I'm going to shut it down. <laughs> you can do your own work. I'll make something of my life. Nasin Walji was there. He said, Arif, do you have an endeavor in Birmingham? I said, yes. He said, what are the financial sort of situation? I said, very poor, very bad. He said, you know what, I'll support you. And because of him, the institute was alive. At that point, I had to let all the staff go. I said, I can't pay you anymore. <laughs> you may leave. Everywhere I would lecture, I would say to them, send the money to the institute to pay its rent off. And Sin Walji came and he made that beautiful offer. If he's here right now, then maybe he will remember this event that once he became so tired of me, he said to me, I'm no longer going to support you. I said, that's fine. I went onto the pulpit, gave a lecture. He said, I will never ever say that again. For as long as you want, I'll support you. I must warn you, my lectures do have a very bewitching effect, bewitching effect on the audience. If you're not bewitched by now, there's something wrong in your hearing. After that came Hujjatul Islam wal Muslimin, Marhum Agha Ilmi. What a great person, an illustrious, noble soul, and a dear friend introduced through none other than Sayyid Hussein Murtaba. When he saw that the Institute had now grown and was encountering difficulties, he began to support through the Ishad Trust. When he saw that he could no longer continue supporting the Institute due to the political restraints. He brought a very noble man, noble in every way, Hujjatul Islam al Muslimin, Agha Nurullahiyan. Agha Nurullahiyan came here. Agha Ilmi said, butter him up. So in front of Agha Nurullahiyan, I said, if you come from on behalf of God, you don't need my buttering. Ilmi said, aren't you audacious? I said, that's the way I speak. Nurullah Iyan said, Arif, for as long as I am alive, you will get all the support that you want. I said, no strings attached. He said, nothing. Do what you want at will. The institute grew again until the time came when Agha Nurullah Iyan was no longer in office. And at this point was the biggest decline of the institute ever faced in its history. And we were going to lock it up when Allah sent our Murabbi dear Sajjad Ibrahim, who is here and who will address us. He showed blind faith and he's taken the Institute to a newer pedestal. His insistence on professionalism, on proper procedures, on proper standards has finally got the Institute where it is. He once came and I sat with him. I said, Sajjad Bhai, I know you have no belief in the Institute. You just have personal affection for me. He said, go and give yourself so much credit. I said, it's your sons who like me. He said, no, I believe in you and I think this can go somewhere. 
Him and the team that he will talk about came together. I must say, if ever I've seen people who have blindly supported a cause, it is these people that I've mentioned, who had no idea of where it's going to go. <laughs> Sayyid Hussein Murtaza, when it was in a little room, he came and he said, this will be the Najaf and Qum of the West. And I used to think it's a mad statement that he's making. But it was the beauty of his heart that made him say what he said. With the aid of such noble souls, this establishment has grown. God does whatever he wills, however he wills, through whomsoever he wills. I will narrate a little story. When Allah says, Ma'indakum yanfud wa ma'indallahi baq, whatever is with you shall perish, whatever is with Allah shall perpetually remain, we need to have faith in these words of God. Al Mahdi Institute is in the 21st century, a century in which possibly mankind will attain the enlightenment for which the prophets have worked. It might be that time where we finally begin to understand that religion is a means toward liberation. Religion is a means towards creating one human, moral, godly family. Religion is a means towards bringing about unity beyond variety and withstanding variety. Religion is about not accepting the other, not tolerating the other, to appreciate the other and to celebrate the other. Al-Mahdi finds itself in such a unique position. It's a very humble attempt. But there are many other attempts like this being made all over the world. We are truly honored that God has given us all this opportunity as a huge family to finally come to this point, to put away our biases, to join hands with everybody and be one. But it has also given us the courage to become self-critical and to say we are wrong here because the truth is beyond my likes and dislikes. So what if you've been perpetuating it for 1,500 years? If it does not, if it cannot be substantiated, then it has to be revised. There is nothing sacred beyond inquiry. And there is nothing more true than the untarnished relationship that we have with our Allah. And there is nothing more noble than another human soul. But I will say this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does his work. It is about time that we awoke to the truth, we humbled ourselves, and we said to ourselves that there is nothing special in us or about us. We are all children of God. We need to now bring religion to a level where religion is critiqued openly, without any embarrassment. Those features of religion that divide, that are intolerant, that condemn, should be confined to their history. Do you think that when Jesus, Isa, Musa, Ibrahim came, that they appealed to the people by saying, we are going to paradise, you're going to hell? We are pure, you're dirty, beat up women and enslave people? In their context, they preached a humanitarian and a godly message. Do you think people would have been attracted to the Prophet Muhammad had he said, I am the only truth, you're going to hell? The Prophet Muhammad said, He said, all of you are going to paradise, didn't he? He said, be truthful, be kind, be loving. He forged two types of beautiful relationships with the people of faith on the basis of common spirituality. For the people outside the ambit of faith on common morality. We need to revert to that beautiful, untarnished faith of Prophet Muhammad. I, for one, in this journey of the Almad Institute, have lost these distinctions in my soul. That he is a Sunni, he's a Shia, he's an Ismaili, he's a Zaidi. He's a Muslim, he's a Christian, he's an atheist, he's a believer. And I think 
the prophetic souls have been trying to give us this message that the untarnished beauty is within all. al -Mahdi Institute hopefully will grow by the grace of God, will be able to talk about religion as it was in the time in which it was initiated, untarnished beauty and the fullness of human aspiration. But it cannot do this save without these beautiful souls and without this beautiful people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to attain his good pleasure. And may Allah bless the al -Mahdi Institute with kind souls like yourselves. There are one or two people that I do want to make a mention of. A lot of the people have been mentioned by name. And I want to thank everybody not from al -Mahdi Institute or as Arif or on behalf of God. God thanks all. But as a very humble servant of the community who feels himself indebted to all of you for bringing about such a beautiful thing through which I am benefiting. Somebody said to me, he said, as I, had I not been in the Institute, I would have done so much for myself. And I replied, I couldn't have done anything but this. I had no qualifications. Don't take that seriously. <laughs> because I know somebody will quote me now. I say to them, I am doing something that I would pay to do. That's how honored I feel. But the internal team has worked very, very hard. And in them, I want to mention two people. And I hope one of them is here who have worked selflessly. Amongst them are Shazim Krishanji and Sheikh Ali Mallah. May Allah bless both of them. Now today is a day that coincides with the great tragedy that we witnessed in UK. Let us recite Surah Fatiha or a moment's silence in their honor, in the honor of all those people who have needlessly and oppressively lost their lives throughout the world and those people who are under the yoke of oppression al-fatiha and a moment so a moment of silence thank you all very much assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Thank you, Sheikh Arif, for sharing with us your nostalgic account of the humble beginnings of Al Mahdi Institute, for your humble appreciation of those who are the backbone of this institute, and for your very heartfelt message. Now comes the part that we've all been waiting for. After years of hard work and commitment to their learning, it's finally time to celebrate our graduates' successful comple completion of the Hosa program. Please can I call upon Sheikh Harif again to come and present the Graduates Awards. I would like to request the graduates to come forward when called and accept their award. So our first graduate is Sayyid Ahmar Shah, who joined Al Mahdi Institute as a part-time student in his late teens, and is now the first ever student to have successfully completed the full Hosa program on a part-time in-house basis. You can read Ahmar's full bio and his plans for the future in the brochure. Um, but in addition to that, Ahmar has taught modules in Urdu virtually as part of the pre hausa program that AMI are currently running in Pakistan. He has taught introductory modules in fiqh, theology, philosophy, usul al-fiqh, and mysticism. So he is already establishing himself as a contributing member of AMI. Ahmar, please can I request you to come and collect your award? Our next graduate is Ali Radha Khaki, 
who joined the institute in 2011 as a part-time in-house student and then switched to full-time studies in order to complete the program. Again, you can read his bio in the brochure, but as with um, Ahmar, Ali Radha is also active in teaching usul al-fiqh and fiqh to year one students on AMI's Hausa program. He's also been mentoring year one students and has delivered tafsir short courses for the general public. Ali Radha, please can I request you to come and collect your award. Our final graduate is Mosaddiq Gangji, who joined the institute as a full-time in-house student and then continued as an offline student from year two onwards. Mosaddiq is now the first ever student to have completed the full Hoza program on an offline basis. He has taught classes in Islamic theology, teaches at his local madrasa, and is involved in the running of the Muslim Student Council and has further information in his biography in the brochure. Mosaddiq, please can I request you to come and collect your award? I'm sure all the guests present here will join me in extending many, many, many congratulations to you all. We will now move on to the presentation of the AMI Honorary Awards. First up, we have the Ayatollah Amini Award for Academic Excellence, in recognition of outstanding contributions to the study of Islam, and in particular Shiism, within traditional circles and Western academia. We would like to present this award today to the world-renowned writer, academic, and modern-day thinker, Professor Abdulaziz Abdul Hussein Sajidina who is currently the professor and chair of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, IIIT, at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Professor Sachedina has not only impacted the world of academia through teaching for over 40 years, but he has also been conducting independent research and writing in the field of Islamic law, ethics, and theology. Aside from academia, Professor Sajidina has been involved in international peace building projects and has served on the board of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy and has been consulted by the US State Department of Defense regarding Middle Eastern affairs. For Professor Sajidina's full bio, please refer to the graduation booklet. I would like to once again call Ayatollah Professor Muhaqiq Damad to come and present the Ayatollah Amini Award for Academic Excellence to Professor Abdulaziz Abdul Hussein Sachidina. And I'd like to invite Professor Sachidina to please come and accept this award and address us with a few words. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Recognition of intellectual excellence is very much dependent upon understanding the goals of institutions of higher education. 
The academic world is full of challenge. My experience began with institutions of higher learning. And I often wondered the Muslim identity of many such institutions in the Middle East where I studied with Muslim teachers, with Muslim ulama. I had to begin sorting out my own identity as an intellectual, but a believing intellectual, in the light of the identity that can shed light on the challenges facing me and the likes of me in education in Islam as a religion and tradition. I do use two separate terms, religion and tradition, what we have inherited as a tradition. How to elevate education from being a servant of the market economy to the market economy becoming the recipient of the knowledge of educated people. That's what we claim in the university. It's a very different claim for the Islamic institutions. We are not giving degrees for Qasibi, for earning money. We are giving degrees for increasing awareness about Islam and the responsibilities we have. What is needed today is, in this educational institution is cognitional theory. How do I know what I know? If I don't know that, then I will not be able to guide others. Seeking a uniformity in any institution of higher learning is fatal. It will destroy the institution to the development of knowledge and application and our indoor endeavors in collective ishtihad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sajidina, for your thought-provoking observations and wise words of advice. Our next award is the AMI Humanitarian Award in recognition of outstanding services to humanitarian development through education and capacity building. We would like to present this award today to Dr. Sakina Yaqoubi, who is the founder and executive director of the Afghan Institute of Learning, AIL. Dr. Yaqoubi founded AIL in 1995 in response to the lack of education and healthcare faced by the Afghan people after decades of war and strife. It's through the tireless efforts of Dr. Sakina Yaqoubi that AIL has established itself as a groundbreaking and visionary organization working with grassroots communities, especially women, to bring better education and health services to the less privileged. Almost 25 years on, AIL has established 306 teaching centers, as well as four health clinics, a hospital, a 12 million listener strong radio program and a legal clinic providing free legal services to poor Afghan women. Since 1996, AIL has benefited over 12 million Afghans through their education and health programs. In 2005, Dr. Yaqoubi was also jointly nominated with 99 other women for the Nobel Peace Prize. I simply can't do justice to her achievements in this short time, but please do refer to the graduation booklet for her full bio. I would now like to call upon Mr. Sajad Ibrahim, one of the main patrons of AMI, to come and present the AMI Humanitarian Award to Dr. Sakina Yaqoubi. And I invite Dr. Yaqoubi to please come and accept this award and give us a short talk.
اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم It's a great honor to be here today Al Mahdi Institute I think it was so generous to give me this honor to be here with this wonderful and great family um, I really want to um, share with you what I have been through for 26 years especially that I hear right now the mission of Al Mahdi I really believe that the mission of Al Mahdi should be worldwide uh, transfer because today as I find out I really I'm sorry to say it I didn't have that much knowledge of Al Mahdi today I hear wonderful message from all colleagues especially from Arif, Sheikh Arif Hussain. I think this is the way that our people, our spiritual people, our religious people, our students go about. Because today is the day that the whole world is in trouble. All of you know this era right now, especially Muslim people are in every part of the world in trouble. And one of the trouble that I really believe, and I am sure you believe, is because that difference. Because we do not practice interfit, as Sheikh Arif Hussain said, as we do not, we have differences, as we think that we are the best one and we are the only one go to heaven, as, as we do not reach out for poor, for widow, for orphan, for a country who is violated against women, against children, that is the issue today. Why I did what I did, I want to share with you. I was living in the United States. I had a good life. I had a good education. But you know what? My brother and sister in the refugee camp were suffering. The women were terrified. The children were uh, orphaned. The elder was driven out of the country. Every day I hear this news. And I told myself, who am I? Why I am better than others? Why I am better than my sister and brother that I sit in this place and have a comfortable life? Islam says that. Islam told us times after times that we must reach out for our brother and sister. And what we are doing, what I do as a Muslim woman, what I do as a sister, what I do as a mother, I really need to reach out. So when I went to the refugee camp, what did I find out? I want to share with you, very briefly, not in detail. When I, when I went there, I saw miserable women, miserable children, and lots of ignorance people, thousands and thousands of them. And they were ignorance, why? Because they did not have education. I find out that the only thing that I could do to help out not to give them money, not to give them food, not to really just hold their hand, to really provide education. What kind of education? Education that really gives them opportunity to do critical thinking. If you are able to do critical thinking, you will find a solution for it. But in my country, in my area, there wasn't a critical thinking. People just closed their eyes, memorized, and they went after it. That was all. So once we start, giving training, doing critical thinking, you should see the women and children change. Today I am in Afghanistan. Afghanistan still is struggling. We have conflict all over Afghanistan. Again, I am so proud to be here, to Al Mahdi. Why? Because you are working through conflict resolution. You are trying to solve problem. You are trying to unite people. And that's what I am doing inside Afghanistan. Today, still, we have suicidal bomber. We see people are blowing on the ear day after day. We saw women are becoming widow, young women, two, three children, and age of 25. They are sitting and being a widow. And you know what? Our country, our people needs education. To be educated, also, they can run out of poverty. In Afghanistan today, poverty is all over the world. And poverty is creating misery, creating sickness. So how we can approach that? Through a good quality education.
When you have a good quality education, a mother know how to feed her child. A mother know how to earn some income while her husband is gone. A mother can be a good symbol for her child that he or she be a good citizen, will not be ignorance, will not go and use suicidal bomber. And that's the reason we are there, trying to provide education. And also I want to share with you, today we must be united together. Because this issue of Shia, Sunni, um, uh, Christian, all kinds of this, this issue is creating separation. It provides us diversity and everybody go to their own direction and everyone says, I am my way, my methodology is the best. So what we should do, I learned through this hard experience that when you create a unity, when you say we are all the same, you achieve so much. It's still my country is suffering that. It's still in my country there is war. But you know, 14.5 million people has reached by AIL, Afghan Institute of Learning. Today we have a wonderful, wonderful, smart woman who are taking initiative, who are being a leader, who are getting in the political arena, who are really transforming the society. We have young men and young women who really change. They are different. They are not believing in tradition as such that makes the tradition in the religion. There is two issues, different issues. In my society, people all mix religion with tradition. That's a different issue. We should not mix it up. And we try to give them training, try to educate them to see the difference and be able to live in a community with peace. And yes, we have a long way to go, but we are doing our best. And I really believe that with Al Mahdi, being a part of this family, I could do a lot more because I am going to come and I'm going to learn and I'm going to study. I am a student also. I am constantly learning. I really, I am thankful for this institute. I am thankful for every one of you who have chosen me to be here. Yes, I have this and that, but the point Al Mahdi is my first step to be, to have a mission and to ishtahad. Thank you very, very much. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yakubi for inspiring us with the truth and the wisdom that you have imparted to us from your experiences and from your humanitarian endeavors. We'd be happy to welcome you here as a student, but I think you'd be more suited to teach us rather than learn from us. I'd now like to call upon Mr. Sajad Ibrahim to come and conclude this evening's proceedings with a short talk on behalf of all AMI patrons. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, respected scholars, ladies and gentlemen, Salaam Alaikum. I'm going to talk a little bit about the reason why I've chosen to support Al Mahdi and to thank everybody who has worked so hard to make this a reality. Aziz Bhai and we were talking yesterday evening and reminiscing about the early 80s in Toronto where we wanted to establish an institute of Islamic learning in the West, a higher institute that would not only do research but also teach and that really did not happen. When I met with Sheikh Adif, I think it was around 2005, I could see the potential of this institute taking place in Birmingham and not in Toronto, which would have been my preference. I even suggested to him that he move to Toronto, which he flatly refused. In 
What distinguishes AMI is that it is dynamic and not inhibited in exploring, exploring the true essence of the faith. In boldly claiming that values can acquire different forms at different stages within an ever-changing human community in different eras and regions to ensure the uninterrupted growth of human community. In short, in other words, distinguishing between the essence of Sharia teachings and that are eternal and its form which can change with space and time. So I guess in short, what really AMI is embarking upon doing is it's saying that the Sharia is eternal but its forms are not. And if one was to really examine that, one would come to the conclusion that a lot of the problems of the world can be solved if one takes that kind of an attitude instead of saying that the Sharia is eternal in its essence and its form. Some of the examples of how these things hinder us in our progress. There is, in the suburbs of Toronto, it's, there's a place called Peel Region, which wanted to give, because there was a lot of Muslim children in that neighborhood, wanted to give a holiday for Eid. The Muslims, number one, could not come together on what date it would be. They could not come together and, and they said that we can only let you know the night before. And so the board got fed up and said, forget it, we are not going to do that. Huh? So those are the things that, that hinder our progress in the West, which are not something that confronts the people in the East because those people are living in Muslim majority countries. Also the fact that Eid in itself, in its essence, is a joyish occasion with families celebrating Eid within the family on different days, where is the joy left anymore? We need to address all those issues going forward and I think Al-Mahdi has shown that it can potentially solve a lot of these problems for the Muslim community. The other important issue is relevance. Sheikh Arif talked about my children. My children are least interested to listen to most of the majalises other than Sheikh Arif and Dr. Sachidina, there are very few scholars that they are willing to go and listen to because there is no relevance. History is being talked about, a lot of other things are being talked about, but this, there is no relevance to their, to their daily lives. Islam has stopped becoming a relevant religion for their daily living. And that basically brought me to think about that we will lose not only our next generation but subsequent generations unless we make Islam relevant to our children, our grandchildren and our communities going forward. What I, my hope and prayer is that Al-Mahdi teaches us and our future generations to lead a God-centric life and progressively grow to our ultimate completion. Now comes my part of thanking everybody. First, I would like to thank our principal donors, especially Mr. Mustafa Qasim, Mr. Mohammed Habib, Faisal Ali Bhai, Jawad Khaki, and all other small and large donors. It is very important that AMI remains a grassroots funded organization and not, is not beholden to any government or organizations that can dictate its course, other than me. <laughs> I'd like to thank the past and present trustees of Al-Mahdi, Sayyid Muzaffar Abbas, Dr. Shafiq Haji, Mr. Mohammed Fazal, Naseen Walji, Abbas Datu, and especially Mehboob Ladak for all their dedication and services. I'd now like to present a plaque to Mr. Zulfikar Merali, 
in recognition and deep appreciation of your exceptional and selfless efforts and hard work towards the renovation of the AMI projects since its inception 25 years ago in the places where AMI has been accommodated. Mr. Zulfikar Merali, can you please come up? The other recipient of the award recognition is Mr. Mohsen Jaffer, who unfortunately could not be with us today for his exceptional efforts and hard work towards the renovation of AMI buildings. We'd also like to thank Mr. Jaffer Rajpar and Mrs. Safia Rajpar for their continuous efforts and hard work towards the AMI gardens. When you go out and see it, you'll see how beautiful they are. Huh? Thank you to Hashim Bata, Dr. Ali Raza Bhujani, Ruksana Banji, Salim Sheikh, Hassan Sumani, Sayyid Ejaz Shah, Sayyid Raza Musafi, and all the faculty and staff at AMI for all their hard work in putting together the Fiki workshop, renovation of the property, and today's event. A very special thank you to Ruksana Banji. Aliza Bojani, and most especially Hashim Bata, for our collaboration with the University of Birmingham. What a fantastic achievement. <laughs> and what can I say about Sheikh Arif? A visionary and the heart and soul of Al Mahdi. Thank you for everything. May Allah protect you and bless you for your noble endeavors. Thank you very much and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Sajad Bhai, for your kind words of appreciation and support for all. Finally, on behalf of all AMI faculty, students, staff, and guests present here, I'd like to congratulate our graduates and honorary awardees for their achievements, and we pray that their success be an inspiration for us all, and they continue on their journey to serve humanity. I thank you all for attending tonight's Hausa graduation and Silver Jubilee ceremony, and sharing this joyous occasion with us. I'd now like to request all guests to make their way to the AMI Gardens, where refreshments will be served. We also have a book exhibition upstairs showcasing some extremely rare and out-of-print titles that were purchased from the Cairo Book Fair in Lebanon, and the new extended AMI English Library open for viewing. If you make your way to the AMI Library, a member of staff will guide you to the exhibition and give you a tour of the English Library. There will also be an opportunity for graduates to have their photos taken with family and friends in the gardens. And lastly, the evening will conclude with a celebratory dinner to be served in the dining room at 6.15. Jazakumullah, thank you very much for being here tonight, for this afternoon and into the night. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>